Hashem. In honor of Hashem, in honor of the tzaddikim, we'll, we'll leave it for another, another time. We're going to get a sponsor for the class. Of the okay, so it's exciting. We're now entering Adar. We're very close to Purim. We're getting closer and closer to Purim. And Boch Hashem, there's, a, it's, there, there's, there's something in the air. There's a, there's a love is in the air, I don't know what you call it, but there's something in the air, Boch Hashem, to prepare us for Purim. Just a little a bit about this Shabbat that we just went through, Shabbat Shkalim. And also it was Shabbat Mishpatim. Shabbat Mishpatim is the sixth Shabbat from the beginning of the period called Shovevin. We started this period, of what's called, I'll explain it after, Shovevin, which started from Shmot. Shovevin stands for Shmot, Va'era, Bo, B'Shalach, Yitro, Mishpatim. Six weeks, which the Arizal, Arizal writes, it's a special time for rectification, specifically of sexual blemishes, working on Kedusha, holiness, modesty, working on coming closer to Hashem and to rectifying the past also. And that, believe it or not, is connected to the idea of being thrown back into bondage and slavery in Egypt. The Arizal writes that the bondage and slavery in Egypt was needed to rectify the drops of seed wasted by Adam Arishon, the first man, in the 130 years that he was separated from Chava. As he took upon himself this type of punishment, for what happened of eating the, of the tree of, of knowledge of good and bad, and afterwards the death of, of, uh, of Hevel by Cain, so he felt that he has to abstain, and in that time he was being heated up, chas and uh, th that those lost souls had to come back in the format of, of the souls who were born in Egypt, the Jewish souls born in Egypt. So the Arizal writes, this is the, every year when we read the parshas from Shemot to Mishpatim, we, in a sense, are trying to rectify this because we also are part of Adam Arishan. We are parts of these souls also that need to be rectified. So every year, it's a cycle that comes that comes back, but we fix every year a little bit of the rectification until finally, when Mashiach comes, it'll be totally rectified by Zatashim. But now, in our context of the classes that we've been giving in the past now, it's been two months, we explained that the bondage of Egypt, Mitzrayim, we said, corresponds to the tightness of the throat. Remember, Metzar HaGaron, the tightness of the throat. Metzar is like a Mitzrayim, right? And Paro is the nape, Ha'orif, the same letters as the back of the, of the neck, to indicate that in Egypt, the, the power of speech was in exile. The Jews couldn't talk out to Hashem. They couldn't pray. The, 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 the weapon of prayer was becoming lost. Along with that, the Ramuna was being eaten away. And that was reflected also, well, we, we quoted the Zohar that says that the Chomer and Levenim, when the Egyptians made the Jews work in the Chomer, on like all types of clay and dough and Levenim, making bricks. So the Zohar explains Chomer and Levenim, Levenim as Libun Halacha. The clarity of Torah law was lost because the Jews were learning Torah. We know already from Yaakov, he sent down Judah, Yehuda, ahead of him. When Jake, when Yaakov went down to Egypt, he sent the head of it, uh, Yehuda to prepare from a Beit Midrash study hall, where they would learn Torah. So we know that they were learning Torah, but the, there was a lack of clarification. There was lack of clarity. So that the Zohar says the Levenim, the bricks, the 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 avodat parech, the the hard work, that the the toiling that the Egyptians were putting the Jews, wasn't just a physical labor, but also caused them that spiritually and mentally there was lack of clarity, lack of dat lack of true da'at, which is clarity in Torah law, and halacha. So the, 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 the Zohar says, levinim, bricks, is libun halacha, to clarify the Torah law that was lost. That's the levinim, the, the, the being enslaved to build these bricks, showing that they don't have the, uh, the, the capacity, the ability to clarify the law. And also, chomer, the clay, is from the chom chomrot, the, 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 the stringency, the difficulty of the learning. It was, it was made much more difficult, the learning. So now, that was the bondage of Egypt, and the goal is to get to this, to this parsha, Mishpatim. Mishpatim is what? Laws. We begin the laws of the Torah, like now the official laws, you know, the law, monetary laws and all types of laws. The parsha was packed with laws. If you look at Mishpatim, from beginning to end, almost to end, tons of laws. Boom, boom, boom. It's a difficult parsha. There's long rushes, and you have to know all the, the, the details of the laws of one bull, he runs into another bull, how much you have to pay, all these details of monetary laws, it comes out in this week's parasha, and that's the goal. The goal now is to come to what's called halacha, mishpatim, laws, is Torah law, and that was the goal. We leave Egypt to get now to clarification of Torah law, and why do we need that? To promote peace. Because we said, 
okay, all these classes, that the clarification of, of, the, of the disputes in the spiritual realm, for example, between Beit Shammai, Beit Hillel, and the oral law, there's always disputes. One Rav says like this, one Rav says like that, and then, okay, Halacha is like who? That clarification which causes peace in the spiritual realm automatically causes peace in what we're going through personally. The attacks of the Yetzirah inside of us causing the concealment of Hashem's awareness in our life, it's rooted in Halacha. That's why it's so important, the, law, the learning of law, and that's the goal to get to Parashat Mishpatim. So that's the idea of Mishpatim. It was also Shkalim. What's the idea of Shkalim? Shkalim was a type of charity. Every Jew had to give. They had to give for the census that they give Shkalim. Machatzit shekel, a half shako coin that went towards the korban, the sacrifices in the, in, the, in, the, in the Holy Temple, right? So today, how does that apply to us? Since this giving of the half shekel in the time of the Beit HaMikdash is a, is a format, is a type of tzedakah, so the idea of shkalim is to arouse the concept of tzedakah. What is the concept of tzedakah? So the rabbis teach. They say and that if a person can't fast, then he should give charity. And they say the reward of agrata the the ta'anita tzidketa. The reward, in other words, the benefit of fasting is to give tzedakah. There's many interpretations, but in one context which we're going to speak about now is that if a person can't fast, then charity can do the same job. Why are we talking about fasting? If you recall, we spoke about all these weeks, the concept of fasting. A person refrains and connects to the beginning. When a person doesn't eat, he stops eating, stops nourishment for the sake of purifying himself. Because we said that the, the throat is the area of speech and also it's the area where food intake connects the body to the soul. This is where the, everything takes place in the throat area. And they're next to each other to show that one influences the next commensurate to the level of holiness of eating, that's how the speech will be, and vice versa. So therefore, to a person who wants to begin to work on himself, to get out of, of the Egypt that he's trapped in, that he can't dive in, try to control the quality and quantity of food, to eat more in holiness. And that is ideally through a fast. The idea of fasting is you stop, so now how are you, running, how are you functioning now? You're going to the beginning. Before you fasted, my body's now running off all the energy and the juices and the fuel and the fats inside of me that I had from yesterday, the day before and everything. So I'm going back to the beginning in order to function now. So the idea of the fast is to start again, to go back from scratch. Charity is the same idea. What is, what is tzedakah? Tzedakah should be a level where I feel the pinch. If a guy has a million dollars and he gives five shekels to the guy in the street, he doesn't feel it. <laughs> tzedakah is where I feel the pinch, and now I'm in a situation, okay, so now I have less for me now because I gave away money to charity, so now I have to do with what I have. I have maybe two onions in the fridge and four potatoes, and I, I, I gave my tzedakah money away and I could have bought without a nice supper and everything, so let me do with what I have. The idea of tzedakah now is also going back, okay, what's until now? What do I have? How can I manage what I have until now? That's the idea of tzedakah, which is similar to the idea of fasting, which is going to the beginning. So this Shabbat was amazing. We had, we spoke about all these weeks, the two rectifications of faith. The clarification of faith through learning halacha, which comes to clarify the emunah in areas of life where there are answers, but in the meantime, I have to hold on to emunah until I get that clarification. And learning halacha opens up my mind to begin to understand more and more what Hashem wants me to understand in life. But in the meantime, when I can't, I have the level of emunah. That's the idea of learning halacha. And the fast is, for, is to help strengthen the emuna of areas and questions that there is no answer at all. And instead of me endangering myself to start having philosophical speculations and getting intellectually involved to try to answer these questions, I put a halt and say, no, it's only emuna. I know if I enter this area of my brain, I'm lost. If I try to answer these philosophical questions, I'm finished. Fasting. The, what's generated from this fasting, which is starting to, again from the beginning, starting from scratch, going backwards, that activates this high level of emunah. It's called shlemut emuna, complete faith. Together, halacha and fasting, these are the two components of strengthening emuna. Even though halacha is learning, it's a type of a learning, but it's a, such a learning that enhances your emuna. Because again, there's a rule in Judaism, tachrit ha the purpose of knowledge is to know that you don't know. The purpose of learning 
It's not to become an accomplished scholar. I know, I know all of Shas, I know all the Kabbalah, I know all the Zohar, I know, I know. The goal of Judaism is the more you know, to realize the more you don't know. Because you begin to see how much more is out there that you haven't even begun to touch. Because Hashem is endless. Hashem is endless. He's ain't self, the infinite one. Meaning His wisdom is also infinite and endless. And the more you learn, the more you discover another mountain behind this mountain. You just pass this mountain. Oh my God, there's another mountain. There's another one. There's another one. I thought it was finished. I thought I was at the top of the mountain. I thought I reached the goal. Only to see behind this mountain, there's another higher mountain to reach. And that's life. The per and, it's, and, and, and there's no excuse. Okay, so I'm gonna just, I'll, I'll just stay stupid and, and enjoy my life. No. Hashem wants you to advance. Because He wants you to enhance your level of Amuna and level of awareness. Amuna, awareness, Amuna. Because there's levels in Amuna. There's the little emuna, the little pip squeak, who has a little tiny emuna, and it's reflected in how much his davening is strong. It's not that strong, so he has a little emuna, and it's reflected in his davening. And there's the guy who really believes in Hashem. He really sees Hashem as guiding his life, and he believes in it. He does. He sees that he doesn't understand, so his emuna is enhanced, and it's reflected in the davening. His davening changes. He's more connected to prayer. He's more into prayer. He knows that as soon as there's something in life that not 100%, I quickly turn to Hashem. I don't try to figure out the problem on myself. I quickly, instinctively turn to Hashem. That's because the person's emun has been enhanced. And that's the idea of learning, especially Torah law. That's what it does. It opens up the mind to begin to clarify and, and, and clarify and then reach higher levels of emuna. So this is a da'at component of, a wisdom component of emuna. And the fasting part activates the higher level. That I'm always starting again. So I always have refreshed, revigored, Re, 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 regenerated emuna for the deep questions and the difficulties in life where it's only emuna and I have to accept it with blind faith and it's my requirement fasting, the idea of fasting which we said is also the idea of tzedakah enhances that so this Shabbat had both of them we had Shabbat Shkalim and we had Mishpat and a nice hint to that that this Shabbat is something very special is the blessing we say every day in the Shemone Esri in the Shemone Esri we have a blessing Melech Ohev Tzedakah or Mishpat. Hashem is a God who loves charity and Mishpat. Charity, we said, is the idea of the fast, of always beginning again. I'm giving from myself, so now I have to deal with what I have in my life. I give away from my, my money. I give to someone else. I give to a cause. Now I have less for myself, so now I go back to deal with what I, uh, to try to manage with that little that I have to try to handle with it, Bezat Hashem. That's the idea of Tzedakah, which enhances this higher level of Amuna. And Mishpat Torah laws. That's just a hint on the greatness of the Shabbat, how it's a major turning point in the year as a preparation for Adar and for Purim, which is a preparation for Pesach Bezat Hashem. Fine. So this is the idea of the Shabbat, why it's so special. It was a very big beginning. And with this Shabbat now, we can approach Purim, Adar and Purim. The Midrash says that Haman, when he said to Hashverosh, you know, to wipe out the Jews, to do away with the Jews, I'll give 10,000 shkalim of silver to your, the, the, the king's coffers, the, 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 the king's otzrot, the treasuries of the king. So the, the Midrash says, you wicked one. The Jews already, with their shkalim, they already came before your shkalim. You think you can win, you can try to buy out with your, so to speak, you know, generosity to give charity to support a Hashverosh? The Jews already, with their shkalim, which has been existing since the time of the Beit HaMikdash, which was destroyed before Haman that you're coming around, has already come before your shkalim to show that the mitzvah of the tzedakah of the Jews is there. It's etched, and that's what really protected the Jews, believe it or not. That's what the media says. That the, the, the merit of the shkalim that they give, that, that, that came before Haman's shkalim. That's one reason why we read shkalim before entering the month of Adar, which is the month of the downfall of Haman. We proceed that with the last Shabbat of Shvat, with the reading of shkalim. Fine. So like I said in these past weeks, Purim is a gift. We have to realize that. It's not just a joke, but it's a special opportunity to activate those miracles that we so desperately need in our day-to-day -day living. Those breakthroughs that we're just waiting and dying for and whatever, and things are not moving, whether on a personal level, whether on a national level, on Israel is suffering this and that, and all types of difficulties and just can't stand what the media is doing and this and that. On every level, Purim is a major breakthrough, Vizat Hashem, to reveal such a light that Hashem is running the world and to see the miracles that it activates. Because of that, it's worthwhile investing in the preparation for Purim. The main preparation for Purim is prayer. To ask Hashem, please let me tap into the light of what's called Mordechai and Esther, the light of Purim, and save me, eradicate from me 
the Amalek within me, the shape changer, the, 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 the distortion of the imagination which is generated from Amalek, just to explain, Amalek, which is Haman, Haman is the descendant of Amalek, has the same numerical value, Gematria as Safek doubts. That all the doubts we have in life, which because of these doubts, we're prevented from advancing the way we should be advancing in life, spiritually, for Amuna and getting stronger in our Yiddish light. Instead, the doubts cause us to be shaky. I no, longer, I, no, I no longer have that force that I had when I was a teenager, when I began my tshuva, when I began my spiritual pursuit. I don't have that force anymore because all these doubts and confusions attacking me in this journey we call life, I can't handle it anymore. So I'm very weak. I'm very weak in my determination to come close to Hashem. It's falling. That's Haman Amalek. And Purim is an opportunity to blot him out, to blot him out, and it's mainly through prayer. We thank Hashem, at least I thank Hashem, that Rav Nossin, the disciple of Rabbi Nachman, he wrote a beautiful prayer, which has been translated into English. I highly suggest people use it to join with your own personal prayers as a preparation for Purim. It's one of the most powerful prayers composed by Rav Nossin. In English, it's been translated in a book called Entering the Light. You have the whole prayer there translated as a preparation for Purim. Personally, I say it every day, because I know the gift of poem, if, if, according to your preparation, that's how the poem will be. In Hebrew, it's in Likotei Tfilot, part two, prayer 37. In any event, prayer is the main preparation, and it's a big thing also to show the depth of the poem story. The whole idea of Megillat Esther, Megillah means a scroll, but also it's rooted in the word Legalot, to reveal. And Esther means Queen Esther, but also Esther is from the word Hastara, concealment. The idea of Megillat Esther is to reveal the concealments, to reveal that which is hidden. The deepest secrets of Judaism, of the Torah, believe it or not, are hidden in Megillat Esther. That's why it's so high, so lofty, and so special, and it's an obligation. Every Jew, man, woman, everyone has to hear the Megillah on the night of Purim, on the morning, because of its powerful spiritual effects that it has on every single Jew to wake up, to reveal that which has been concealed until now. That's why it's such a gift for him. Again, it's the happy part also, the joking, the getting drunk, and the simcha, which is part of the thing, it's part of the mitzvah, for sure. But behind that is the emuna of what you gain, what you get out of Purim. And if you invest properly in Purim, you can get a lot out of the Bezat Hashem. So now some insights in the Purim story, Bezat Hashem. The Midrash says like this, that when Haman originally suggested to Ahasuerus that he wants to wipe out the Jews, so Ahasuerus was very in doubt, you know, uh, he knows already from past history that anybody who messed up the Jews, they got it, they got, they got in trouble. So Ahasuerus, the Midrash says, said to Haman, here in the capital Shushan, we have here the representatives of the 127 nations in which Ahasuerus was king over, right? It says that he, was, he ruled over 127 nations. By the way, it wasn't the entire world. It says, it, always you see in the Megillah, that when Ahasuerus was talking to Esther, he said, was saying over and over again, Ad ve'te'as. Whatever you ask of me, Esther, up to half of the kingdom. So the Midrash says, within half of the kingdom, Ahasuerus, he didn't conquer the whole world. In total, there were 127 times two nations in the entire world. That's what? 254. 54. Seven times two is 254, and there was one more, that's 255. He was under half, he got under half, and was as a punish it was given as a punishment to Nebuchadnezzar and Koresh and the various other kings of Persia and everything that Ahasuerus took from them half of the kingdom. That was, that was his whole kingdom, it was 127 nations, fine. So Ahasuerus said to Haman, let's ask the representatives, the, you know, the Shagrir, the, what's called the consulates, the, the consulate of each nation, which is here in Shushan, the capital of Shushan, let's ask their opinion if they agree to wipe out all the Jews that are located in their 127 nations. So Ahasuerus summoned all the 127 ministers, and he said, Haman wants to wipe out the Jews. Do you guys agree? So they said, Haman, wake up. Don't you know that anybody who started the mess with the Jews, they had a terrible end. Look what happened to Paro. Look what happened to Sichon and Og. Look what happened to all the people who started up with the Jews. Don't you know that they are the chosen people? They're the apple of the eye of Hashem. Don't you know that it's so dangerous to start up with them? So what did he say, the Midrash says? And this is unbelievable. The Midrash says, like the, Haman said, yeah, it's true what you said, but their God is now old. 
He's old now. I don't know that he's old. He's a kid. He's an old king now and can't take care of the Jewish people anymore. How do I know that? He allowed his holy temple to be destroyed. And the fact that he allowed his holy temple to be destroyed shows he doesn't have the strength anymore to protect his nation. Like those absolute unbelievable miracles that happened in the splitting of the Red Sea, in all the conquests of King David and King Shlomo, all the miracles of Yeshua to conquer Eretz Yisrael, Shaul HaMelech, all the Jewish kings and leaders that they had tremendous success because they were righteous and Hashem was with them, they don't have that anymore. Proof, look, Nebuchadnezzar succeeded in destroying the first temple. As the Midrash says, as soon as he said that, they immediately agreed. He said, ah, oh, he's old? Okay, we sign. And then the Midrash goes on to show the document. It's a very funny Midrash. You get to see it if you have a chance. I think in the, in the Torah anthology, the Mamloez, translated by Ari Kaplan, he brings the Midrash. It's so funny, the letter they put out to, to convince the 127 nations, just the way the Midrash presents it, it's like a comedy in a way. It's very funny how the presentation is. But what's the point? There's a question here. Why? He just said one thing. Their king is old. As soon as they heard that, they agreed immediately. Okay, we agree. What any arguments? They just put a, they just put forth in front of Haman a good, solid argument. They said, you know, you mess up the Jews, you're finished. Look at past history. And he said, it's no longer the case anymore because their God is old. And without retorting and fighting back, it's a risk in this. Immediately they said, okay, what's the idea here? The idea of being old means if Hashem is old, it's because his nation also is old. If they, they, it works together. It's to, it works both ways. If their God is old, that means they're also old. What's, what, is, what does it mean old? What's old? The emuna of the Jewish people became stale, became dry, became dead, because there was no what's called hitchachut. There was no renewal of the emuna. There was no renewal. So the, the, the nation said, ah, so they're like us now. We're also living in this world. Our faith of a spiritual existence is very stale. It's very empty. It's very dry. It's just, by the way, it's just routine. It's just like devotion, like a performance of a ceremony, ceremonial. But there's no meaning to it. So they're like us now. If that's the case, we can go ahead and attack them. And we agree. If you brought a proof that their God is old, that's why the temple was destroyed, we accept that argument. Meaning that that, that was the one, that's the <coughs> one point that sticks the Jews out of everybody else is their renewal in their emuna that their God is not old, but he's a new God. The real truth is Hashem is new. And Hashem is always renewing creation. We say every morning, every morning in davening, look at the first blessing of the two blessings before the Kriyat Shema, the Shema and the morning prayer. We say every morning, even on Shabbat, HaMechadesh Betuvo Bechol Yom Tamit Maaseh Bereshit. Hashem is someone who's always renewing constantly the act of creation. It's not like creation happened six days and it's just continuing from then. No. Hashem is renewing. This day is a new creation. It didn't exist. It's not like, oh, I saw the sun set tonight and it's going to rise again tomorrow. And it's just a cycle. No. Hashem creates the sun to come out again. It's a, new, it's a, it's a constant way of looking at things. It's Hashem is mitchadesh. The moon coming out is a new moon. It's a new day. It wasn't a new day. It's like it's not connected to yesterday, it's not connected to last week, it's not connected to the, to the month, it's not connected to the year. It's a brand new, unique creation. And that, my attitude of the day is dependent on my imuna with that, in line with that, that my imuna is renewed also. That I'm not just doubling again for the 500th time in my, in my life or the 5,000th time I'm saying again another boring shacharit prayer, another boring birkat amazon, another boring prayer because I've said it 5,000 times already. It's a brand new prayer and brand new experience in life of me connecting to Hashem, my Muna is renewed. That's, that's the renewal. And when the, no, the nations heard that their God is old, and they're old, ah, so then there's no difference between us and them. And the fact that there's, and, and the Haman convinced them that the Jew, that he said to Achashverosh, they make, they, they're parasites, they don't keep your holidays, they keep only their holidays, the Shabbat. Every day they have a holiday, every, every week there's a Shabbat, every month there's a Rosh Chodesh. Always they're eating the Jews, they're making festive meals, there's Yom Tov. They have excuses every time, every night there's a wedding, there's a Brit Milah, there's a Bar Mitzvah. <laughs> they're, they're all, there's parasites, they're living off the government, they're eating, consuming tax money. They're doing nothing, these Jews. All they're just is eating and eating and eating. And when it comes to our festivals, no, it's forbidden, we can't eat, they can't drink our wine, they can't marry into it, there's no intermarriage with us. So that heated, heated up the nations. When Haman used that, if there's no difference between us and you guys, so why are you doing that? It's not right. 
Why should you not keep the festivals of the king? And we, yes, if there's no difference between us now that you guys are the old king, that was the old king. Ah, that was number one. Okay. Fine. So we see that. Another Midrash. We're going to try to connect things soon. The Midrash says something amazing. Rabbi Akiva was once, was once teaching his disciples, and he saw that they were beginning to doze off. The students were beginning to sleep a little. So Rabbi Kiva said to his students, do you know why Ahasuerus merited to be ruler over 127 nations? It's because Hashem foresaw that the tzaddikah, the tzaddiket Esther, the descendant of Sarah, who lived 127 years, was going to enter into his castle to be part of his life. So in her merit, Ahasuerus merited 127 nations. And that Midrash says that's what worked. That's how Rabbi Kiva woke up the students. So there's a question on this Midrash. Where, 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 what's going on here? Where, the, the, what, how is this to wake up the students of Rabbi Akiva? Why, the, the, so, so what? Okay, it's a nice chidush. It's a, they're all, anyways, Rabbi Kiva's students are learning Torah of Rabbi Akiva. And he has to throw in this point. What sticks out from this idea that Rabbi Akiva said the connection between the 127 nations of Achashverosh to the 127 years of Sarah? What you see here is the message to wake up. What is, what is Sarah's 127 years? What does Rashi say in Parshat Chai Sarah? He says when she was 100, she was like 20. And when she was 20, she was like 7. Which means what? That Sarah, Yimenu, she mastered the concept of renewal. She was a tzaddika from beginning to end because at 100, she was like 20. She was always renewing, always going back to the beginning. Like we spoke about all these weeks in Judaism, the concept of Hitchhatshut is so important in every area of your life because it's connected to Emuna, and especially in that, where people want to become something, accomplishment, become, get a BA, become a doctor, become a big person, a big shot and everything. Judaism is the opposite. Judaism is you become someone, you're about to reach level 2000, before going to level 2500, you go back to zero. What is this, you go back to zero? Yes, we start again. I build up, I get to 2,500, I get to 3,000 like that. And now when I get higher, I go back to zero again. You're wasting your time. Just You're up there already. Continue. That's being old. That's now a zaken. Zaken it means old. Like when, when, the, when Haman said, their God is old. The word in Hebrew is zaken. A zaken also means an elder, right? He's an elder, which you, which you think is something positive. You respect an elder and everything. But it's, zaken is not good. Rabbi Nachman once said, Old is not good. Even an old tzaddik, an old Torah scholar, old is not good. You always have to be renewed, chadash. This was the secret of Sarah. Sarah Imenu. That's where Rashi says it clearly. At 100, she was like 20. 27. Always going back to the renewal. That was the secret of Sarah. And with this, Rabbi Akiva woke up his disciples. Because of the secret of Sarah, to able to, to, to have this renewal by telling them this teaching, with this teaching itself, Rabbi Akiva activated and woke up the idea of the student sleeping and through to the concept of Sarah. But now, it's connected also to Esther. There's a connection between Esther and Sarah. The connection is obvious. Both were taken captive, right? Sarah was taken into the house of Pharaoh, and Esther was taken into the house of Ahasuerosh. But that's where it stops. Because Sarah got out, Esther, she stayed. She didn't come out. She stayed there for the rest of her life. She didn't come out in the end. So there's a difference here. What's the difference? The Gemara teaches, siman <laughs> Avram and Sarah going down to Egypt and then coming out was an indication of what's going to be. That Avram's descendants would also go down to Egypt and come out. Esther also, which happened after the destruction of the first temple, going in and not coming out is indicative of what we're going through right now. That we could, that until the, the, the fact that Sarah got out and there continues to be an exile, there continues to be a life after that and a continuation that shows that her coming, the, the nation, the Jewish people coming out of Egypt, that, that there's a continuation after that shows that there's still an exile after that. There's still a continuation to the story. But by Esther not coming out, it indicates that it's only for the future. That for only that's going to be a coming at the very end, she's going to come out. There's no coming out and there's a continuation of the story. We don't know the continuation. She, she's there, stuck, until the whole story of 
world history is complete. And that's why Purim is the only festival connected to the future. When Mashiach comes, there will be no more Pesach, no more Shavuot, no more Sukkot, but there will be Purim. Purim is the only Chag, because it's connected directly to the future redemption, and that's the idea of Esther not coming out until the whole rectification of the whole creation is completed, then she comes up. Then the final, final story is it. Okay? So, so this is the idea of Esther needing, though, fuel from the concept of Sarah. She needs the aspect of Sarah. We said that Sarah connotes speech. It's called, it's, 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 it, it, Sarah is Serara, it's Malchut. Malchut in the Kabbalah corresponds to speech. And Sarah going into Egypt as the idea of holy speech being trapped in the exile. And then when Sarah came out, that's the idea of the speech coming out. Fine. So Esther, because of the 127 that the, Gemara, the, the Midrash connects between the years of Sarah to the nations that Ahasuerus had due to Esther, shows the connection between Esther and Sarah. Now, another point. The Megillah says that Esther is also called Hadassah. Right? It says, Esther, he had that son. Why do I need this, to know this point of knowledge? What does it help me to tell me that her name was also Hadassah? So the Midrash explains, look at the numerical value of Hadassah. We have her Samech, which is 60. Hey, hey, that's another 10, that's 70. And then Dalit is 4, so it's 74. One for the word itself is 75, that's Hadassah. What is the number 75? That was the age that, Sarah, uh, that Esther was when she was taken by Ahasuerus. The Midrash says, what is this? Ahasuerus now, he just killed Vashti, and his advisor said, they have to find a new, more beautiful woman to replace Vashti and everything. She takes a 75-year-old woman? <laughs> what is this? She was 75 years old. What's going on here? So the Midrash says that she had activated in her the blessings of Sarah. Sarah, she was old, and she became young again. So Esther Malka had the exact same blessing as Sarai Menu, as that she had this youth. Okay, but what's this number of 75? So the Midrash goes on to say that here is hidden the idea of Abraham. We have until now Esther connected to Sarah, 127, 127, and the idea of the renewal, fine. But the number 75 corresponds to Avraham Avinu. How? When Hashem told Avraham Avinu, Lech Lecha, Me'at Secha, right, Parsha Lecha, Go, go to Eretz Yisrael in order, to, in order that I can spread your fame and I can, began, I can begin now the Jewish nation that can begin at that time that Avraham Avinu left his father Terach, left Haran to go to Eretz Yisrael, he was 75 years old. And the Midrash says, go at this age 75 and you will be the preparation for your future descendant, Esther, who's going to be also 75 years old and we're going to bring into her your power, your merit of Avraham Avinu. What's Avraham Avinu? We said, if you remember, that Sarah corresponds to complete speech, meaning that there is blemished speech and there's holy speech. When fasting takes place and there's a refrainment, because I'm always going back to start again, or an actual fast where there's no nourishment for Egypt, which is the throat and the Mitzar, Mitzrayim, Paro, the neck, and we said the three tubes, the kane, veshet, vredin, the esophagus, trachea, and the jugular veins, which we said correspond to the three henchmen, the three officials of Pharaoh. This is the wine steward, the chief baker, and the chief butcher. They're those ones who fuel Egypt by improper eating, or eating which is not out of emuna, right? <coughs> so, so we said that Sarah is, is a type of speech which is which bypasses that. And once you fast and you break the clutches, the stronghold of Egypt, so Sarah comes in, Dafka to Paro, the house of Paro, to collect the holy sparks that were there until now and to bring them out. That's the idea that when when Pharaoh took Sarah and he wanted to touch her, she, she, she told the angel, attack him. And, and, and he was being attacked by Naga, Hashemit made Paro. And then it says, Avram and Sarah left with all these riches. These riches were just physical riches, but also the holy sparks which were left in Egypt Trapped, they were able to bring them out. So Sarah corresponds to the holy speech which goes into the evil and by being holy speech, that, that, that person who davens while in the domain of Egypt is able to smash through and break the enemy and also collect all the good that, that was there beforehand. 
Okay? So that's the idea of Sarah. Avram is the one who prepares, prepares this to happen. Because Avram is called the man of Chesed. Chesed always corresponds to water. Water corresponds to Chesed. If you look at the spheres, water is something which is beneficial. The world needs water, right? Water is is a bounty. The, the way Hashem created the world, that He gives rain for free. That's Chesed. Hashem is doing kindness with the world. As opposed to fire, which consumes and destroys, fire corresponds to Gvura, severity, judgment. Water is Chesed, and that and Avram is called Isha Chesed. Avram, the man of Chesed, corresponds to water. So when a person now fasts, and now the Egypt in here has no nourishment, so what comes down is what's called the waters of Chesed. There's no physical water here, but now that the, the Pharaoh and Egypt, they can't cause me that I can't daven, I've, 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 I've now cut that from me, so now I can now daven from the darkness due to Avram Avinu, his light of Chesed, moistening my throat that I can come and talk holy words. That's the idea of Avram, Chesed, and water. So Esther Hamalka, she had both of these forces, the force of Avram Avinu and Sarah. She needed it when to, she approached Achashverosh. We said last week, she told Mordechai to order the Jews to fast for her three days. Tsumu alai shloshet yamin. Why did she tell them to fast three days? To activate, number one, the merit of the ancestors, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. But it works backwards. It's first Yaakov and then Yitzhak to get to Avram. That's why three days. So she wanted to fast. <coughs> the Jewish people should fast because she's the representative of, of the whole Jewish nation to make this miracle happen, to blot out the decree of Haman. So fasting was needed to break the hold of Pharaoh, which was causing the Jews that they couldn't inquire like they were supposed to, as a preparation for Sarah on the third day to approach Achashverosh and to be fulfilled with speech and to cry out to Hashem and to get her get the miracle activated of Purim. So we see the idea of fasting hinted in the idea of, of Esther, that she told the Jews to fast. Dafka and Pesach, of all days, the fast was on the eve of Pesach, the first day of Pesach, there's no Seder that year. That year they did no Pesach Seder. They fasted the first day, and Queen Esther's meal with Haman and Hashverosh was on the second day of Pesach, when they were supposed to eat, but they were in such a time of danger, and the moon of the Jews was so tainted because they ate of the Seuda, the feast of Achashverosh at the beginning of the story, that was done purposely by Achashverosh and also Haman, by the way. It was purposely done, this that the Jews should partake in the meal in order to blemish their emuna by getting them to eat of Achashverosh's meal that, that caused that now Egypt, the, 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 the klipa, the evil force called Egypt, had the stronghold on the Jews and their emuna was tainted and therefore they were stuck. And that's how Haman was convinced to get the Jews that there's no way to renew, to have this hit chatshut. They're old, their God is old, let's do it with the Jews chas v'shalom. So now, by stopping the Jews from eating, the fasting for the three days, specifically on days when you're supposed to eat, right, the day of Pesach, right, and then the, the, the second day, and the first day was really the fast day of the firstborn, the Bechor, the first the firstborn they fast on the eve of Pesach. Here, the whole nation was fasting, the men, the women, the children, for three days they were fasting, this activated the power of speech. Mm -hmm. So what comes out of all this, the idea of Esther is the idea of renewal. The key for Amuna and activating the miracles of Purim, which we need, because a Jew should feel, should feel that he has also a personal Haman Amalek standing over him, and he wants to do it with him. Like we say in the Haggadah, Every generation, they, the enemies, whether physical and especially the spiritual enemies, enemies, they stand on us to try to do to destroy us totally. That if I feel Haman Amalek, he's attacking me, and the main attack is that he makes me feel futile, that I'm it's hopeless, it's useless, I'm finished. Hashem has abandoned me, Hashem doesn't care about me, Hashem doesn't listen to my prayers, I'm very far, what does Hashem have to do with me? I'm such a sinner, I'm such a blemished person. If I was maybe Moshe Rabbeinu, then he would listen to me. If I was the Baal Shem Tov, he was a Rabbi Akiva, but I'm a nobody, and not only am I not a nobody, but I'm a blemished nobody, so what chance do I have that Hashem will listen to me? All these are the arguments and the attacks of the Amalek inside, and by renewing, by starting again, okay, I'm starting a new page, a new day a new tefillin, a new starting, a new beginning, that severs the, the, connect, the, the, 
the attachment, the stronghold of Haman Amalek, who makes me crazy if I see if the idea is that there's no more hope. And just the opposite, Emuna is the, the, is the idea that there is always hope. Hashem is infinite. Hashem is endless. If Hashem wants, He can do an outright miracle if He wants to. It's dependent on what? On my level of Emunah. Hashem is willing to do anything to help me, to save me. But it's up to how much I believe in Him, how much I trust in Hashem, how much I rely on Him 100%. And that's dependent on Emunah. And Emunah is the idea of fasting. Not that, like I said, not, not just actually fasting, but the idea of fasting, which is start always starting again. And that's the mm -hmm. idea of poor. The message of Esther, she has the combination of both these forces of Avram and Sarah, which together correspond to the idea of renewing, starting again, and then the, the, is released, released from a person, from his inner kishkas come out, comes out his power of speech, power of prayer, and then he can really put forth a davening to Hashem, and we have a rule, when a Jew davenes with all of his heart, Hashem listens, Karov Hashem, Lechol Korav, Hashem is close to all those who call out to Him, to those who call out to Him in truth. To call out in truth means that you, believe, you, you, you see clearly that Hashem is listening to your words of prayer. Because that's what prayer basically is, that you're talking to Hashem. Like we said, not talking to the sinner, I'm talking to Hashem. So now that awareness is truth, and my emunah now is infused in that truth that the words of prayer do something, move things in life, and that determines how much I put my energy in my davening, and that, that's what activates my prayer. should be zochim mamash, that our prayer should be enhanced. We should have an amazing Purim, before Purim and after Purim, where we see a change in our amuna. And it's based on, basically, the Yichat 127 of Sarah and the 75 of Avraham. Together, the idea of amuna and prayer being strengthened until we were to fix all the damage done, and to bring final Mashiach with the Shandim Rabbi Amen. Amen. Okay. I thought that um, Esther was reunited with Mordechai at the end. This, is, this, is, this was not. Okay. Okay. See, on a, on, a secret, uh, on a secret level, we spoke about this once. The Zohar says that um, she had in her power a female demon. And whenever Ahasuerus summoned oh, Esther, he would send the demon to go to her to Ahasuerus, and she would <laughs> disappear. She'd go on like under underground tunnels to go to be with her true husband, which is Mordechai. But she had to live this type of existence to the end. That's according to the one opinion. There's another opinion that says that when Esther said in the Megillah, that she said, okay, she said when Mordechai said to her, listen, if you plan to hide and not to do anything to save the Jewish people. Hashem will save the Jews from another place. If you're not going to be the one to save them, Hashem will save them from another place. But you, if you don't do this, then you, you're going to be assimilated. There's nothing left of you. So she said, okay, get the Jews to fast. And I'm going to come and approach on the third day. And she said, and just like I'm lost, I will be lost. What's the word redundancy? Just like I'm lost now. That I'm I'm lost in this in in, in, in uh, from from being with you, my husband Mordechai normally like living at home. Now I will be totally separated from you because now I'm gonna be with Hashverosh willingly. In other words, to be she was until now she was like the Gemara says that so long as she was married with Hashverosh it was considered like nothing. It wasn't considered like she was a Gentile because when the Jewish woman doesn't want to be with the Gentile man, it's, it's, there's, no, there's no relationship here, there's nothing here. It's like an earth, whatever. So she said, now now that I'm willingly going to be with him, to agree in order to get him to come to the meal, she said I have to approach him to, to try to be with him. And once she does that, so the woman loses her rights to be with her husband, that's it. She's Eshapi, she's a married woman, she does something else like that, that's it, she lost everything. That's what she said twice, Avaditi, Avaditi, now that I'm lost, from being with you openly, now I'm going to be lost forever now. I can never come back to you again. That's one opinion in the Gemara that says like that. But we see the, the, that she never came back. However, interestingly, there are two opinions where she's buried. There's one opinion that she's buried in Shushan, Shushan in, 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 in Persia right now, in Iran. The people who visited the Kebra of Mordechai and Esther, they're buried together. There's another opinion that there's somewhere in the north, in the Galil in a place called, I think, called Kaddish Naftali. There's some village north of Miron, and they have there, they, they say, the care of Mordechai and Esther. So what's interesting is that they were buried together in the end. In the end, they were buried together. 
So, uh, but it, we know from the story that she never left, that she was with him until the end. Right, question is this. Um, um, in talk, comparing water with Hesse, yeah. um, would be accurate to say it's not because water is free, because, but because it's so expensive to transport, <laughs> even, even 50 feet from the well to the camel. So, so it's the spread, it's the, it's the desire to take on that uh, effort. Uh, that's part, part, it's part. not because it's free, it's expensive. It was always expensive. Water. Watering, yes. in other words, uh, irrigation and stuff like that. And also livestock. Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean? The, the, the well, water? Transporting range? water to where the livestock uh, is located. No, but Hashem, uh, the, Hashem gives the, the, the rain. Hashem is the one who gives rain, is what causes everything to grow in the world. If there's no rain, there's drought, and there's no food. It's very simple. But the man has to transport it because it's right. everywhere you need it. Right, but even if you transport it, uh, the salt, salt water of the sea is not good enough to, to irrigate, right? It's not, it's not, that's not how you irrigate land with salt water. A company. All right, any more questions? Yes. Uh, <coughs> the union of Machatita uh, uh, Shechem. I mean, in the ancient world, uh, the, the the uh, commerce was based on the garden, but after uh, you know, the gas shekel it had to be the currency. Why? What do you mean? What? I'm trying to just another question, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, what's the significance of the... Uh, of a half shekel or of a shekel? Mm -hmm. or, or a half shekel. Okay, fine. This Rav Nassim explains beautifully. Rav Nassim in his work, the Kuta Al-Khali, explains an amazing explanation. Why a half shekel was given, as opposed to a regular shekel. Just give a whole shekel. Why a half shekel? What's like that half shekel? So one of the reasons that we gave the shekel, right, was to count the Jewish people with the census of how many Jews were there, right? The half shekel. Right, the half shekel, the half right. Shekel. Yeah. So now, what's the reason given? So we know the story from King David, when he counted the Jews, there was a plague and over 20,000 Jews died and he realized it was because he counted them. So from then we learned that you're not allowed to count Jews because it causes what's called Ayn Hara, evil eye. What evil eye? Which evil eye? Of the nations. You've got to be kidding. The nations are billions of people. We're the smallest, we're the smallest nation in the world. What you, even back then, what, what evil eye? <laughs> the nations which are millions of people you know, billions of people, whatever, and we're the tiny nation. That, what evil eye? What, what, what evil eye is there? We're, we're a tiny nation already. What are they jealous about? We're so small anyways. What's, what is the evil eye generated by counting that there was, there were in the tribe of, of Asher, there was 55,000 Jews, and the tribe of, of Yehuda, there's 67,000. The Torah goes on in the census twice, right? We have the census, and they're counting. Uh, look at these small numbers. You know, we're talking about billions. Even back then, there, were, there, there was China, there, were, there was the uh, Saxony, there was Europe, there was Africa, Kush, and everyone. And they had millions of people. And that's tiny Jewish people. There's Ayn Hara. Come on, what, I, what evil eyes there? So, Russell says something amazing. There's a big difference between the Jewish people and the rest of the world. In that, we are one soul. We are all connected, we're interconnected. So that means if you have three Jews in a room, let's say Ruah and Shimon and Levi, they're so connected that you can make different combinations of them. It's called in, in mathematics called factorial. What does it mean, for example? If I have Reuven and Shimon, so I have two entities, there's Reuven and Shimon. But because they're so connected, I can play games with them, I can move them around. I can do, for example, there's Reuven and Shimon like this. So I have one presentation of Reuven and Shimon. When Reuven's on the on the left and Shimon's on the le on, on the right. But I can also switch them, I can have Shimon and move in, and it gives a different presentation. Because they're so connected, the Jewish people are so connected, it gives <laughs> off different presentations at every time. That's two. Now if I add Ruben and Shimon and Levi, how much do I have? It's factor of six combinations. Because now I have Ruben, right, Ruben, Shimon, Levi, Levi, Ruben, Shimon, Shimon, Ruben, you do that, there's six combinations. A, B, C, A, C, D, D, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, C. You have six combinations. That's how we work. Because we're so connected, like it says, that there were 70 souls, right? Uh, Yaakov and there's 70 uh, nefesh. It says in the singular, we're one soul. 
And when, as opposed to when the Torah gives the details of Esau's descendants, it says souls in plural, nefashot, that there were 70 souls, and also by Ishmael, there are souls in plural. What's unique? There were one soul. Meaning what? That we can play games in how we are, how the presentation of our souls are. I can have Reuven here, or I can have him here, or I can have him in the middle, and it makes a difference because they're connected. Okay? What? Sorry? They're not equivalent, are they? What do you mean? The Jewish people? Yeah. Well, we're not equivalent, but we're connected. connected. We have what's called Aravut. Yeah. Every Jew is responsible for the other Jew. Yeah. Why am I responsible for my fellow Jew? Because we're connected. If he cuts his finger, ow, oh, it hurts me. Ouch. <laughs> it hurts me. Spiritually, he gets hurt. It hurts me. It's all like, what do I care about him? You know, that's him and this is me. That means we're the same. We're, we're the same in our soul root, but every Jew has a different color. Different colors of the same soul. It's one soul, and we have different parts of that soul. But all the, all connect, the, the, the veins are connected. The, the inside, the, 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 the veins and the arteries, they're all connected. We feel each other. That's why when we hear, for example, and there was a, a tragedy in France. We all heard it. We all feel it. When a Jew is a, there's a bomb and a Jew is blown up in the other side of the world, there's a Jew, oh my God, how come we're like that? How come we get shaken? Because we're connected. We're so connected. As opposed to the nations, so I'm okay. There's, a, there's other people in the world. It's okay. He's gone, my brothers. But by Jewish people, it's unique that we feel we feel the we feel the connection strongly. So the souls are connected because of that it's factory. So when you have three Jews in a room, it's not just three Jews. It's six soul combinations of these three Jews. Now go up to four. How many is it? It's already twenty-four. You go up to ten Jews in a room. The numbers are already in the in the millions. The combinations, people who work for for Bell, you know, and Bell, you know, all the telephones, you have all the tel the digits. They know that they see the combinations that you can do with just digits. You have like a seven-digit number, a ten-digit number. There's so many combinations; it's un it's it's unfathomable. The numbers are endless. So in that sense, we are the biggest nation in the world because we work on factorial because we're so connected. So the combinations, the 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 connection of the Yidin is not just you have ten Jews in the room. It's not ten Jews. It's one million something combinations of these ten Jews. It's like two, ten, ten million new, so to speak, souls. They're called houses. The Sefer Yitzhak calls it houses. We're called houses in these combinations. Jewish souls producing these houses, that activates the evil eye of the nations. In that sense, we're the biggest nation in the world because of the combinations we produce as opposed to them. There's only five billion, five billion Chinese. It's only five billion. That's it. You can't do this, you can't play this game of factorial. Whereas by Jews, you have five million people in a room, the number is astronomical. And that is the evil eye. That is the evil eye. So that's why the half shekel was given to show of the connection that I'm a half of my fellow Jew. I need my fellow Jew to complete me. I need, I need every Jew. It's like machatzita shekel to teach, because it's for the census. The idea of the shekel was for the census to count the Jews. So it being a half, Showing that I'm, I'm not a complete unit on my own. I need my fellow Jew. We're all connected. It works. It's half for every in relationship to each one. It's it's half to him. It's half to A. Half to B. Half to C. My relationship to all other yidin is I'm a half. I'm not complete. I need them. We're all together. We're one unit. That's why it's half a shekel. That's the idea, the beauty of it, of the shekel, and why it's called a half to show this arevut of the connection between the Jews. Yes. Come. Um. Where, does the Gemara or Rabbi Nachman or any sources suggest any other ways of, of uh, intoxication on Purim besides alcohol? <laughs> like dancing? <laughs> the halacha says in the Code of Jewish Law, it says, it's clear, it's clear there. Chayav inish vidisume beforia. A man is obligated to get intoxicated to drink. That's the idea. The ideal. The Ramah, he brings a, 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 a leniency that if now you drink a little and you go to sleep, so you're, you're, it's as if you did the obligation. You go to sleep, so you're, you're drowsy and you're sleeping, so you did the mitzvah according to him. But that's ideally, it is to drink the wine. It's, it's so important to drink wine, because when you drink the wine, the, ya, the, ya, the word for Hebrew of wine is yain, right? Yud, yud is 10, plus another 10, it's 20, plus 50 is 70. That's the gematria, the numerical value of sod, the okay. secret. And since the whole idea of pouring is to reveal Esther, to reveal that which is concealed, so it's very important to also for every Jew to drink, to reveal their inner essence. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? That people normally go all year round who are yearning to come close to Hashem, and all year round you don't see anything from them. When such people, they drink on pouring, 
you hear the most unbelievable things coming out of their hearts. In other words, people who drink in holiness, we all people who all year they're yearning, they want to come close to Hashem, but they have so many ups and downs in life, it's not working. On Purim, the power of the drinking of Purim, when done for the right intention, it brings out the person's inner yearning, who he really is. You see, it comes out of the open who he really is, and that's the goal of Megillat Esther, to reveal the hidden. What's hidden? Who you really are. Who are you really? Your inner desire. What is your inner desire? Ah, it's to come close to Hashem. So that's the purpose of poem, is to bring that out, to come out. And wine does that. The drinking of the wine, because it's gematria, which is sod, has the power to bring out who you really are. And when that's activated, speech is activated. When the yearning of a Jew comes out, he can daven better. His davening is enhanced. That's the gift of Purim, is that there's a, hang, there's a spiritual hangover. <laughs> once, it's act, once it's come out who I really am, even if I forgot what I said, people said, you know what you, know what you said yesterday, you know this, you know that. People like they, they saw how you were when you were drinking on Purim. But there's a spiritual hangover that now that it's come out, so it's here, it's revealed now. I can start again. I can now have con contact with my inner desire which came out on Purim and now use it in my personal service of Hashem, in my prayer, in my devotion. It comes out. That's the beauty, that's the importance of Purim also, of the drinking, the part of the drinking. Okay, so then a related question, and this is off the Purim subject, but lately I've just been, you know, between Kiddush on Shabbat and Pesach and Purim and the wine festival. My, wine my, festival? Uh, there was a wine festival. <laughs> I, I'm just, and the Chaims and the Fabrings. Right. What does the Rambam say about just, you know, how to, I mean, how much wine can the liver process, just really, literally? Well, it's not good to drink too much. How much do we drink? Well, Once, uh, Rabbi Nachman, he gave to his disciple, Rabbi Nassim, Yeah. And the two disciples, they had Rabbi Nassim and Rabbi he gave for both of them one little cup and a little drop of schnapps. And, and Rabbi Nassim said to Rabbi Nachman, is this enough for both of us? So Rabbi Nachman said, a little bit is also good. And Rabbi Nachman says, when it comes to schnapps, only a little bit is good. That's it. He was very against drinking, obviously. And uh, the, the breast liver chassid, for example, they hardly drink. Even, even those on Shabbat, some of them, they just do on grape juice. Not everyone drinks on wine, it's hard for them. But the drinking is mainly just Pesach, the four cups, and, uh, and Purim, and Shabbat for Kiddush. But the optional drinking, when people, they get to sit down and want to drink, it can be dangerous. When, when a person is not drinking out of a Seudat Mitzvah, rather just enjoy themselves, there's a danger that this can activate the bad inner desires which are inside of me. Purim has the power to bring out the good inner desires. That's why it's a mitzvah to drink on Purim. It brings out the good inner desires. But when drinking not in holiness, it can activate the bad. So with that in mind, you have to be very careful how, how much you drink this and that. Even though you said the rubber brings down in health, drinking a little bit of wine is good, red wine, white wine, talks about the Rambam, about the Indian of health and everything. I've got to give it again, today's society, where it's so, the tendency of people is to be depressed. People are looking for an escapist, a, escapist situation to escape their inner misery that they're going through. And they turn some, to, most people turn, a lot of people turn to alcohol for that. In that sense, the Rambam wouldn't say to drink today in his time where that wasn't the main problem. That other problem is fine. But as severe as it is today, where the, the, the depravity of the generation is so severe, that even just a little bit of, of uh, enjoying oneself and going over overboard can be dangerous. So it's it's a different uh, different ball game. It's different today. Anybody else? What does Rabbi Nachman say about the Gemara, which talks about you can have sugar instead? Does you have sugar instead of wine? Yeah. I never you heard of that. You're a real bucky Gemara. Listen, I don't, I don't know the Gemara that well. I, listen, I learned it from a I, I don't know about that. I, I don't know. That doesn't mean anything. I, I, there's many things I don't know. I'm just saying, uh, I, I, need, I need to hear that. I never heard that before. Which means I have to do some more studying, I guess. I never heard this thing about the sugar instead of uh, wine. Also, because uh, women aren't always obligated to drink also, no? Right. It could so be. But, but no, there's there a. An but on Purim, there's an Indian. Women are obligated to eat the Purim feast, the Purim meal. Yes, the woman has obligation to eat the Purim meal, and part of the Purim meal is to drink. Even a little bit of drinking on Purim is not so, not so bad for a woman on Purim. If it's done again for the sake of the Purim light, the Purim miracle, to connect to the joy, there's no problem. It, uh, it's, a, it's, it's not a problem because it's part of the meal.
on port. Port means the, you have a protection. Port means the protection. 